for the Lord. And I'm going to have you turn your attention to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. It's good to see all of your faces. And uh, it's good to see some of you whose habit has not been to come on Wednesday nights, but since you've been in discipleship classes, now you're starting to show up on Wednesday nights. This is a good habit. Keep it up. Glad to see you. 1 Kings chapter 16. I want to back up just a little bit uh, before we get to exactly what I want to focus on to give a little bit of context. And so I'm going to start with verse uh, 29 of 16. I apologize if I didn't make that clear. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29. Ahab, son of Omri, began to rule over Israel in the 38th year of King Asa's reign in Judah. Um, He reigned in Samaria 22 years. Now, those of you that have been through Bible studies with me, you remember I tell you that when you get to kings, it gets confusing because you have two kingdoms, which means you have two sets of kings, and you have prophets that come from one kingdom and go to the other kingdom, And kings doesn't always tell you which kingdom or king they're talking about. And so in this particular verse, Ahab, son of Omri, is actually ruling over the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And King Asa is ruling over the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And so Ahab reigns for 22 years. Verse 30 tells us, Ahab, son of Omri, did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the king's before him. And as though it were not enough to follow the example of Jeroboam, Jeroboam, you will remember, is the gentleman who began the northern kingdom when they split from Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Jeroboam, in order to control that northern kingdom, set up idols, set up golden calves in order for them to worship. So, As though it were not enough to follow the example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians. And he began to bow down in worship of Baal, or Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an an Asherah pole, which would be Baal's actual consort, the female counterpart. He did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. It was during his reign that Hiel, a man from Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. When he laid its foundations, it cost him the life of his oldest son, Abiram. And when he completed it and set up its gates, it cost him the life of his youngest son, Segub. This all happened according to the message from the Lord concerning Jericho, spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. And you'll remember that God told Joshua, never rebuild this city, never allow its walls to be rebuilt. Now, before we turn to chapter 17, just a little bit of of extra information of how wicked the circumstances are, because the the cultic practices of Baal and Asherah were were perverse in the extreme. From everything that we can tell, um, Baal and his consort Asherah were a part of a type of of cultic worship known as a fertility cult. And what this referred to is the idea that the gods would only bless the land if, in fact, you worship them in a manner that was pleasing to them. And Baal and Asherah actually, also known as Ashtaroth, you may run into that uh, pronunciation of it as well, they required that each family, in order to receive their blessings, would bring their firstborn child and sacrifice them. To the goddess. Imagine that. And then. um, Associated with this. Many think. At the exact time. That the child is being sacrificed. The. Man was to then go. And. Sow his seed. Among. Asherah's prostitute. Priestesses. Yeah. Now, we live in a day and age that's pretty wicked. I often say that the days of the apostles were, was a pornographic world. And if you don't believe me, take a trip with me to Turkey, and I'll show you all the statues that were around the public squares. And you'll find out very quickly that um, they knew how to stick it out there. It was pornographic. 
But I don't, you know, this was pretty bad too. When the king is, is marrying a, a queen who imports this, who, who doesn't just import this, but, but builds upon this and, and forces this and makes this prevalent. And you can go back and read Ahab's father Omri was no righteous man himself. So things are wicked. Things are bad. And um, you and I are living in a, in a world that is spiritually under attack. But God does not want us to live according to the vicissitudes of that world. The vicissitudes, what I mean by that is the up and the down. The roller coaster ride of life. God has not come to give us a life that is subject to that up and that down. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to challenge you with an example and challenge you to learn from that example. Because into the midst of this evil world, into the midst of this problem, God inserts a human being. And this is what he's been doing and this is what he will continue to do for all of time. God will insert himself into an evil situation by means of human beings. He has greater faith in you than you have in yourself. And if you study the biblical narrative from the beginning to the end, God has continued to place his faith even when we have failed in human beings. Now, you can either say, God, you're crazy and you need to leave me alone, or you can say, thank you, and I'm going to do the best that I know how. And so tonight, I'm going to assume that you're going to take the latter option. You're going to take it as an honor and a privilege to serve the king, and you're going to say, how do I do this best? How do I do this well? How do I follow Christ in a manner that is effective? So into this mess, God inserts the prophet Elijah. How many here have heard of Elijah? Most of you. He's one of those famous prophets. Well-known prophets. Doesn't have any book named after him. Doesn't have any writings. Elijah, at least according to the biblical text, was a prophet of action as opposed to a prophet of words per se. And uh, I want to look at his example and I want to try to use his example as a means to talk to you and talk to myself about these vicissitudes of life and how I need to respond in a world that is under attack and in which God says you can make a difference. Little old me. I can make a difference. Not because of me alone, but because of me along with God. My weakness is a perfect environment for his strength to be brought forth in perfection. All right, so let's take a look. So you got the picture, you got the context of how evil it is, how nasty it is, how twisted and perverted it is. I mean, it's got to make a warped person to, 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 to kill your baby. Then turn around and while that's happening, leave, leave your wife at the temple and, and go out and have sex with a temple prostitute. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to warp some things. Gonna make, that's going to make a really sick society. You know, how, how, how are the marriages doing after that was done? Not well at all on either front. And that's just what we know. That's just the broad strokes of how twisted and how turned it was. And yet God said, I'm going to send a prophet. Now, let's take a look. Verse, chapter 17 now, Elijah, who was from, and this is where we get introduced to Elijah, okay? So right in the middle of this context, boom, here comes this man named Elijah. Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Yes. Absolutely. Let's pray right now. Jesus, in your name. God, you know what is happening. You know the particulars. 
And God, I call upon you, Lord, as surely as Elijah called and said the heavens would not ring. God, I call upon you, and I ask you, Lord, to perform a miracle right now. Jesus, God, I know that you can handle this. There is nothing too hard for you. And I, God, I agree together with my brothers and my sisters that you would touch and that you would minister. Perform a miracle right now. God, everything, let it be done according to your will and let your hands be all over this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We can trust him. We can trust him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I don't know what Elijah's frame of mind was when he spoke these words. I don't know if he came from a place of trepidation or if he came from a place of faith. I don't know if it thundered out or if he kind of mealy-mouthed it out. But the bottom line is, is that what Elijah experienced was that after proclaiming these words, these words that we can, by reading the story, find were powerful because the rain did indeed stop. The Lord then says to Elijah, go to the east and hide. Now, I want to pause right there before we, before we read any further. You've proclaimed, now go hide. What do you mean go hide? I mean go hide. I like when the Lord gives me a word. I don't like when he says go hide. He says, go hide by Kirith Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. For all of you that um, are a little health conscious about your food, you might have had to go a few days, but you would eventually eat the food. So Elijah did as the Lord taught him, camp beside Kirith Brook, east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up. So I've proclaimed the word of the Lord, and what do I get for it? I go hide. And then the very word I've spoken is now impacting me. Because the brook's dried up. There's no rainfall. Well, the Lord then comes to Elijah and says, Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. In other words, leave Israel. Go to a foreign country. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. He asked her, Would you please bring me a little cup, a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. Great, God. You have me proclaim the word that ultimately dries up your provisions. Then you tell me to go to a place that has no provisions. This woman literally is gathering the last firewood of her life to cook the last piece of bread for her and her son to eat together and then go lay down and starve to death. Anybody feeling me yet? Anybody seeing the story here? But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her son continued to eat for many days. That was an up. Cool. Cool. Every time they ate a meal, it was a miracle. Because God didn't say, go to the barn and you're going to find a big sack of flour. No, it's just every time you go back, there's going to be enough in there to make three more pieces of bread. 
There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse and finally died. Then she said to Elijah, O man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and resultantly kill my son? But Elijah replied, Give me your son. He took the child's body from her arms, carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying, laid the body on his bed. Now listen to this. Listen to Elijah. Because all we get is Elijah raised him from the dead. No, listen to his prayer. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, why have you brought tragedy to this woman who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? This is the prayer of a man of God, of a, of a human being who's trying to follow the direction of God, and it's making absolutely no sense what's going on. What are you doing, God? Why are we down again? I spoke forth your words, then you said hide. Then I see the first flock of ravens come and I get used to the brook and the water and you've provided for me. It's a miracle. Then the brook dries up. So then you send me to a widow and I get there and she don't have enough for her. But then the miracle happens and there's enough, there's enough for us to eat. But now her son's dead. What are you doing, God? Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Can anybody identify? Because we humans struggle to remember the ups when we're in the downs. Let's be honest here. Let's, 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 let's be frank here. We're not going to get anywhere if we're not honest with ourselves. That's what we do. We struggle to remember the miracles of the past when we're in need of a miracle in the present. Yeah, it is everybody. It, it, it's everybody. I can tell you the greatest men and women of God, they have this trouble too. So he stretched himself out over the child three times, cried out to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer, and the life of the child returned, and he revived. Whew. Back up again. Elijah brought him down from the upper room, gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, Now I know for sure that you are a man of God, and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Now me, I'd gone, shoot, she didn't always believe me. Now I know for sure. Well, what did you know before? Well, it was give and take there. Chapter 18, later on in the third year of the drought. So we get the impression that the brook and the widow are the first two into the third year. They're all a part of Elijah hiding, staying out of sight. One, he's hidden off by a brook that nobody knows where to find him, and then and another, he's hiding out in another country. Later on in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab. You want me to do what? See, we, we read this story too often we, we we we've gotten used to how it flows you need to stop for a minute and think about if you were actually having to do this this means the king has now spent two and all and into the third some period of time so at least two harvests have gone by that he ain't had no food now what kind of king you think he what what, what mood do you think he's in because you proclaimed Publicly, at my word, the heavens will no longer bring forth rain. And it will not bring forth rain again until my word says it. That, go read it. That's what Elijah said. Now, I, you can't do that as a human. That's God speaking. But, you know, the last time I checked, just because I speak for God, you all get mad at me. Hello? Hello? You forget that it was his anointing that was there. You forget that it was his word that was there. When you are ticked at something that's been preached or taught, it's not about God. God goes on the back shelf. It's you. It's you, preacher. I'm just letting it sink in a little bit, okay? So, so God then speaks to this, and he says, 
Go present yourself. I love the wording of that. Go present yourself to Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. So Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Now, a little parenthetical phrase here that we're going to get. Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. Once when Jezebel tried to, had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden a hundred of them in two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. So Obadiah's a good guy. So Ahab says to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. My people, I don't care about. My, my horses and mules, they got to make it. Kind of king you want, right? So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once, bowed low to the ground before him, and says, Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master, Elijah is here. Oh, he's going to spread the wealth. The Lord tells Elijah to go and present himself to the king who's dealing with a severe famine. And now Elijah tells Obadiah to go and tell the king. And so you see Obadiah says, oh, sir, what harm have I done to you? <laughs> that you are sending me to my death at the hands of Ahab. For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. And each time he was told, Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. And now you want me to go and say, go and tell your master, Elijah is here. But as soon as I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will surely kill me. Yet I have been a true servant of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid a hundred of them in two caves, supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master, Elijah is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. But Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty, in whose presence I stand, that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. So Obadiah goes, he goes to tell Ahab that Elijah had come. And Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So it is really you, you troublemaker of Israel. I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who are supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and those prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver? Hobbling between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. They were an Eastern audience. They weren't from the South or the Midwest. They didn't shout, Amen. They just sat there staring at him. Kind of like y'all are doing right now. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish, cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood of the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. Pretty cool contest. 450 prophets on one side. One crazy man that Ahab's been searching the world over to find on the other side. What? Might have been. I don't know. 
way he was whining, he might have gone back to the palace. You'd think he'd be with him, but I don't know. Maybe he wasn't. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls, prepare it, call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So they prepared one of the bulls, placed it on the altar. They called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. Surprise, surprise. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. I love this passage. He was either nervous or feeling really powerful. I think he was feeling pretty powerful for whatever reason. You'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming or relieving himself. Don't you love a new translation? Y'all didn't know that's what it was saying, did you? Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be wakened. His alarm didn't go off this morning. He's snoozing. So they shouted louder and they followed their normal custom and they cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But still there was no sound, no reply, no response. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. This seems to imply that Elijah had picked a spot where there had been an altar of the Lord before. And so he actually takes that altar and he repairs it. He takes 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. He uses the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar, large enough to hold about three gallons. He piles wood on the altar, cuts the bull into pieces, laid the pieces on the wood. Then he says, fill four large jars with water, pour the water over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. When they were finished, he says, I'll do it a third time. So they did, as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. At the usual time for the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Please, please do it. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven, burned up the young bull, burned up the wood, burned up the stones, and burned up the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. Now, I could have my dad come up here and probably uh, give you a scientific explanation of how hot it had to be in order for the water to basically evaporate at the heat. So God burns up the stones, he burns up the wood, he burns up the sacrifice, and he burns up the water. And by the way, it was a soaking wet sacrifice. It was soaking wet wood. It was soaking wet rocks. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground, cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. Whoa! He's at a high point. I mean, he just stood there and and, 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 and prayed that simple prayer and watched the fire of God come down and God didn't he, didn't, he didn't do it lackluster. Man, he showed up and he didn't just take the sacrifice. All he needed him to do was to burn up the wood. Go back and read it. All he needed him to do was burn up the wood. No, he burned up the sacrifice. He burned up the wood. He burned up the rocks. He burned up the water. So Elijah's like, yeah! That's it, Jesus. Woo! High point. Stay with me. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. I imagine he did that pretty with, 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 a, with a grin on his face. You better hurry up, go get something to eat, because rain's coming, dude. Remember I told you, it wasn't coming until I spoke, and I'm speaking. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bowed low to the ground, and prayed with his face between his knees. 
Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him to climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. Kind of like Monday night. And soon the sky was black with clouds, a heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his coat into his belt. That means he basically pulled his skirts up above his waist. And he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. This is a pretty cool day. You've come out of two and more years hiding. You've presented yourself to Ahab. You haven't lost your head. You baited him and his prophets, and God showed up spectacularly, and then he gets to give you special power to run faster than a chariot. Woo! Now, I... Remember, we're on, we're on the topic of the vicissitudes of life. You're going, man, Steve, you haven't even got to your topic yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just remember, we're using an example. It won't take me long to tell you what I need to tell you. Chapter 19. Look at how quick we go from high to low. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. The one she had imported. The one she had paid for. The one she had built a new house for. The one she had put in clothes. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. So this man who has stood on a mountain who has prayed a prayer, who has seen the Almighty drop the fire down that has licked up the altar, licked up the water, licked up the wood, licked up the sacrifice, who has with his own hand killed every single one of these prophets and has run faster than the speed of a chariot with a king who knows how to handle horses racing a rain cloud. This human that God has confidence in was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah. He's out of Israel. And he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, which implies that he went on into the Negev desert. He went down into Mount Sinai desert. He travels all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and he slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more. Or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. The food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, some preachers need to stop preaching and just read the word. It sometimes tells the story a lot better than even we do. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Welcome home, Sylvia. It just hit me that you've been in Brazil. Welcome home. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. 
And I am the only one left now, and they are going to try to kill me too. But the Lord said to him, go back the same way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Haziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel-Meholah, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Haziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape, from Je escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bow bowed down to Baal or kissed him. You just heard the ministry of Elijah. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, some preachers would be standing right here and in the five minutes left of this lesson would be looking at you and saying, we got to do better than that. We got to get rid of the ups and downs. We got to be on a perpetual high for Jesus. I got bad news for you. That ain't happening. Life has vicissitudes. It goes up and down. It has really good times, and it has really tough times. The key is this. Don't make life's decisions when you're walking in your flesh. This means when you're down... Don't make decisions then. It also means you got to pay close attention to when you're up. Are you up because you're where God wants you to be and you're walking in His Spirit? Or are you up because life just happens to have thrown you something that in contrast to where you were, down, feels really good? Because we can have the perspective of seeing that in Elijah's life, Elijah was always being taken care of by God. Whether at the brook, whether at the widows, whether, whether when he's standing before Ahab, and even when Jezebel threatens. But you see the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs of life, they impact us. They cause us to either feel really, really good when we might not need to feel so good or feel really, really bad when we don't need to feel so bad. And the problem is, is you can't necessarily control how you're feeling, but you can control what you do in the midst of those feelings. I'm not here tonight to tell you that you won't have days that are just horrible days. Last week, my wife knows, and I won't even tell you, because I, I mean, I said it in no uncertain terms. I just go, God, please help me. This is just a crappy week. On so many levels. Just, just, it just, it was just horrible for me. Nothing went the way it was supposed to go. This one's not much better. I can't control how I feel in the midst of that. But I can control what I do. I can not draw conclusions. I can refuse to trust those feelings. And I need to learn to wait on the Lord. Till those moments when we know 
in the Spirit, our Spirit bearing witness with His Spirit, that now I am in the Spirit. And those are the moments when you make the decisions. Those are the moments that you take the actions. And then when it goes to the pits again, you hold on to those decision points and you do not back off from what you're supposed to do even though you feel like everything is falling apart. And what I've just described for you is what is called the walk of faith. Don't make decisions based on the vicissitudes, both the lows and the highs of life. Look at this powerful prophet. Look at his ups and his downs, all within the will of God. Look at the mistakes that he even made, his wrong conclusions, his wrong responses, all based upon the vicissitudes, the cycling, the movement up and down. You and I can learn from this prophet that all things are in God's hands. All things work together for good. And that is a fact that we put our faith in. And even when it doesn't feel like it's working out, even when it doesn't feel like it's working out, even when it doesn't feel like it's working out, we choose the points where we know the Spirit was present. The Spirit spoke. And that defines our reality, not the vicissitudes of life. Not the ups, not the downs, but God, He defines it. And the more that we can speak to ourselves, that we operate that way, the more that we can find in the midst of a crappy week, Peace that passeth all understanding. Joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Temperance that we don't bounce to and fro as children tossed about. We have to learn. We have to expect. Life is like a roller coaster. And most of the time, the highs aren't all that. And the lows aren't all that. But in this world in which wickedness is happening, we need to learn to make decisions only when in the Spirit. And I'm not talking about you're in the Spirit so you're just out of it, so you can't even think. I understand. You can get so out of it in the Spirit that you don't know what's going on. Let me tell you something. The more mature you become, the more you can also have your brain fully plugged in and the Spirit still be fully operational. You don't have to just be knocked out in order for the Spirit to have control. But those moments when you realize that you and God, you are tuned into one another. Those are the moments. You do not have them every day. You might not even have them every week. You may even go for a few years without having those pivotal moments. But those things that have come from those moments, those directions that have come from those moments, you simply will not move from those moments. That's what sets your life. That's how you make decisions. That's how you operate. And you refuse to move from those moments. Because life is up and down. And if you chase the up, it will always be followed by a down. The fire of God fell. The prophets are killed. And he's hiding out in the desert saying, God, just kill me. Can anybody feel me tonight? Anybody know what I'm talking about? We can go from a Sunday service where God moves powerfully. And then by Tuesday morning, man, everything is just in the drink. You got to not make life decisions based upon the vicissitudes of life. Make them based upon the Spirit. 
Learn to walk in the Spirit. You will not be in those places all the time. You will not be able to... St- That's called heaven, ladies and gentlemen. That's when your body is replaced. That's when sin is removed. That's when the biology of your life is is, is wiped away. The brokenness of your mom and your dad and of your grandma and your grandpas. The, 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 The horrible decisions that maybe even you have made that have brought problems into your life. All of that trash. you got to understand that's not going away until heaven. But in this life, God has faith in us. He's looking at human beings broken and flawed and saying if you'll just listen to me in those moments when I speak and stop following the highs and stop following the lows but listen to my voice and obey my voice obey those moments and refuse to deviate it's all going to come out the way I planned it and when I find you out in the desert I'm going to ask you what are you doing here Well, Jezebel's going to kill me. No, she's not. Because I got a dude called Jehu coming. And Jehu is a muscle man. He's Arnold. He's going to catch her eye. She's going to paint herself up. She's going to get all pretty. And she's going to sit on the windowsill. And she's going to try to seduce Jehu. But Jehu's going to call out to some servants who are going to throw her down and the dogs are going to eat her. Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? See, you can't know about Jehu until God speaks to you and says, now go to Damascus and anoint Haziel. Go to Damascus and anoint Jehu. And whatever Haziel doesn't handle, Jehu will handle. See, we don't know everything in this walk for God. But what I can tell you tonight is you don't have to make your life decisions based upon the vicissitudes of life. And God never promised you as a Christian that you wouldn't face the vicissitudes of life. That cycling. One moment you're euphoric. Megan and Rosh are enjoying it right now. They've just made a big move. Psh, that's going out the window in just, uh, I don't know how long, maybe a few days, maybe a month, maybe a few months, but it'll go out the window. You're going to get used to it. I'm glad to see you've moved up a few rows. A few more, and then we'll be good. The new will become old. I'm, I, I'm really enjoying my little yellow car, but I'm noticing it, it's not all that anymore. The vicissitudes of life. Amy visits twice and says, I gotta get to the East Coast. And 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 and, and then she gets to the East Coast and it's pretty cool. And tonight she's she's tired. <laughs> it's not euphoric anymore. Life has suddenly become life. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter where you're at. Kiara, when college ends, there will be a career. There will be something that you step into, but then that will ebb and flow. Shane, school's done. Now you're in. you got a little pocket money. It's nice, but you've gotten used to it, haven't you? Now it's starting to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. See the vicissitudes of life. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Don't make decisions in that mode. And when you find yourself in that, refuse to make a move until you and the Almighty have gotten to a place where you are in the Spirit. Because the only being in this world that is not subject to the vicissitudes of life is Him. And if you'll listen to Him, He can pierce through all of that. And you can live a life that, yes, you will have ups and downs, but you can make decisions that are not subject to the vicissitudes of life. Can we stand and thank the Lord for his word? Lift your hands and your voices to him and thank him. Jesus, I love you tonight. God, I praise you and I magnify you and I thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your kindness. Oh, Jesus, thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in you. 
God, we do not have to be subject to these vicissitudes, these ups and these downs. God, they come and they go. God, we will deal with them. But you are faithful. You will speak at the opportune time. You will speak at the right time. And God, it's in those moments that I make my decisions. It's in those moments that I place my faith. And God, it's in those moments that I take my direction. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the examples you provided for us. Encourage us tonight. Give us faith and give us hope. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. If you have not signed up to help us out with regard to the food for the repast,